Let's work on the next script 2A on accuracy assessment. If you look at our supervised classification workflow, we have done this so far, right? We have collected training data and we have classified the image. Some of you are happy with your image, some of you are not, but how do you decide what is good enough? So we need a quantitative measure to assess the accuracy of the data, actually accuracy of your classification. So we learn the technique of how you can determine how accurate your classification is. The standard machine learning practice to do this is to divide your training data into two parts. Let's say you have a thousand points and you say, I will only use 700 points for training. Remaining 300, I will save to check the accuracy of my model. So you have a training fraction where you train your model and then you have a validation fraction where you use to test the accuracy of the model. Remember, this is your training data. You already know what is the correct class because you have labeled that. So at those remaining points, validation points, you already know what is the correct answer. You check your correct answer against the model's answer and compare where the model got the output correct and where it made a mistake. And you train the model with training data, test the output with the validation data, and uh, you generate something called a confusion matrix. And this will tell you how uh, good your classification results are. From that confusion matrix, you can generate this different matrix. Uh, they are called different things, depending on if you ask the remote sensing person or you ask a machine learning person. They are essentially the same, but they, they have a different terminology. So the most important one is the overall accuracy is I had, you know, thousand samples out of that, how many are correct? And that's your overall accuracy. There's something called precision and recall. This is a machine learning terminology. In remote sensing, you call them producer's accuracy or consumer's accuracy. Uh, also, there's a, something called F-score that is quite useful, which is essentially the average of precision and recall. So it gives you a good metric to say how good and reliable your model is uh, with those two metrics. So we'll learn how to compute all of this using Earth Engine. But again, all the metrics out of all of this, the main one that you'll want is the overall accuracy. This is what I end up using for tuning my hyperparameters, testing the model's accuracy, and so on. So let's see how it works. When you generate a confusion matrix from your validation data, it looks something like this. The way to read this is on the left-hand side, on the rows are all your labeled data. And on the columns is your predicted data. Here in the first one, you see that this 41 is where you ha had labeled 41 of these points as zero, class zero, and the model predicted them to be zero. This 43 points were where you had labeled them one, and the model said they are also one. So all the diagonals are where the model got the answer correct. If you look at these points, you had labeled them zero, but model said they are one. So this is where the model got confused. And that's why this thing is called confusion matrix. So everything in diagonal is where the model got correct. Everything that is not in the diagonal is where model is getting the predictions wrong. And again, it gives you insight into how good the model is at predicting certain classes. For this one, you can say that this uh, class three model is really good because it got everything correct. Versus class two, it thought some of the points were labeled as class two, they were actually class three. And this helps you determine where you need additional training data or additional features that will help the model learn better. Using this uh, confusion matrix, if you just look at the diagonals and divide it by the total, you get the overall accuracy. These are all the points that were correct. So here it said 94% of your validation data were correct. So your model accuracy is 94%. If you do this row wise, where you take each class, correct values divided by the total value for the class, then you get the producer's accuracy. And if you do this for columns, you will get consumer's accuracy. This metrics, I find them not to be very useful in actually tweaking the model or doing the classification, but they are generally used for documenting a model. So if you're asked to document a model and say, give me all these accuracy numbers, you can generate them using your attention. All right, let's learn how to compute this confusion matrix and uh, get all this uh, matrix in our engine. We are starting with script 2A. It's a similar script, but now we have extended our region to be a larger region. 
So we now are working with a uh, basin. This is the same basin that I had shown earlier. We have just selected the basin ID and we have taken some training samples and we have done the classification. But you can see we have quite a few GCPs here. I'm going to print the number of GCPs here. So what I had done was uh, we had you know 500 or so GCPs. We exported the feature collection as an asset and then imported it here. So let's just print how many GCPs we have. So we have 447 GCPs. And when you try to sample this many GCPs from this large composite, you get an error like this. And I left the error in here so I can show you how to fix this. You might see this kind of errors quite often. The error says that when you are trying to sample this, the computation is too large. And the error doesn't make sense because it says the computation is 80.6 megabytes, but the limit is 80 megabytes. And if you think about how Earth Engine works and processes petabytes of data, why are you getting an error for 80 megabytes? Right? The reason this is happening is because when Earth Engine runs, it determines what's the optimal size of the tile to be sent to each machine. So it takes your region, splits it into small tiles, each tile is sent to one separate machine, which processes that. And whatever Earth Engine determined as the default tiling size, that tile turned out to be 80.6 megabytes. So each machine has to process 80.6 megabyte to cre uh, create this classification. And with this scheme, it turned out that, you know, this was too large because the Earth Engine puts a limit of 80 megabyte per machine so that your competition runs faster. And it also suggests you how to fix this error, that you specify a tile scale parameter. This is the parameter that we have not seen before. So let's see. There are quite a few functions that have this parameter. So if you're using any of those functions, you are able to set this tile scale parameter. We are using the sample regions. Let's look at the tile scale. It says the default value is one. You can increase it to two, four, up to 16 to increase the number of machines that you use. So if you specify the tile scale to be two, it will now use twice the number of machines. Your tiles will become two times smaller. So each tile will be 40 megabytes and you'll be under the limit of 80 megabytes. So if I come here and specify a larger tile scale, this error will go away. I typically do not like to do this by default because I don't want to consume more resources than I need. But whenever we encounter such error, it's useful to just set the tile scale to be a high number. Maximum number you can set is 16. Set it to 16 and it'll just use more machines and your competition will finish. If you encounter such errors, there is a really helpful page in the user guide, the debugging guide. So this is a page that is on the Earth Engine user guide. We'll add a link to this. This has a lot of... Uh, helpful error messages and how to fix them using uh, the commonly used techniques. So if whenever you have some error, look at this page, it'll give you some ideas of how to fix your error and write your code in a more efficient way. So you can see this classification has been done and it looks pretty good. If you just zoom in and inspect it, it looks very good, but how good, right? We want a accuracy metric. So instead of just saying, okay, it looks good to my eye, can we get a number of our uh, how good is the classification? So let's do the accuracy assessment. So we have our GCPs. And we're going to split them into two parts. 447 GCPs, we want to split. We want a training fraction. and a validation function. Let's do 60% points will go as training, 40% will remain as validation. You, uh, you can use 80, 20, 70, 30, depending on that. If you have a lot of training points, more than you need, maybe uh, 60, 40 is a good thing. So you have more validation points, the more accurate assessment you get of your accuracy. The more important part is, how do you split your data into two parts? The most important part to do is, you want to split them randomly. You do not want to say, I'll take the first 60% points and do this because the first 60% points might be all urban. 
right? You don't want to take that and remove the rest of it. So you want to split them randomly. Earth Engine provides you with this function called random column that can be used to split the data into two parts. So let's see how this works. We're going to run this function called random column. This function has some parameters. We can leave it to the default names and I'll show you what happens. When you run this function, random column, it adds a new column to your feature collection. Remember, our feature collection is just gland cover, but now it added a random value to it. And each feature will have a different random value. The default is a uniform distribution between zero and one. That means you have a equal chance of getting a value between zero to one. And that means if you get values like 0.15 or 0.93, you can use that as a substitute to say, if I want 60% of the points, anything below 0.6, I will select it. So I'll randomly select 60% of the points because the distribution is expected to be uniform. You will get roughly 60% of the points, which are less than 0.6. It won't be exactly 60% because again, it's a random numbers that uh, you know uh, might have a few uh, numbers uh, skewed either way, but you get roughly 60% distribution that way. So this is a good technique to say, let's run this and uh, we'll select all points which are less than 0.6 and I'll get a 60% split. If I select everything less than 0.7, I'll get a 70% split randomly. The, in Earth Engine, all the random functions are stable across different runs. So I did something, I ran my script again, I'll get the same random numbers. It would be chaos if it gave me a different random number each time, right? Because then every time I run the script, I'll get a different answer. So your random numbers are stable across different runs of your script. You can also change what random numbers you get using this seed. So you can also force a particular uh, random number across different scripts if you use a different seed. So you can say seed zero or seed one, and you'll get the same random numbers across uh, different instances of the script. Okay, so we got our thing. Let's use that to split the data. So I'll say my training GCP will be gcp.filter. I'll apply a filter, EE filter less than, we'll say whatever values random less than 0.6 will be my train. So you have values expected from zero to one. I'll say anything less than 0.6 will go to training. Anything greater than 0.6 will go to validation. So I will say validation GCP and we'll say GTE. So greater than or equal to 0.6 will go to validation. Less than 0.6 will go to training. Let's check how many points we get. So in our training GCP, size, print validation. So we had 447 GCPs, 271 was selected for training, 176 were reserved for validation. And this uh, ensures that we have a random split and we have enough thing. If you want 50-50, do 0.5.5. If you want 70-30, do 0.7.7. Here we are using the same number because the filters are different. Less than 0.7, greater than 0.7. Now we have done our split. We can say when we are doing the training, do not use the GCPs. Do not use the GCPs, just use the training GCPs. So we have not used this 176 points that we have saved for ourselves to check the accuracy of the model. And you will see the model will run, it'll do the classification, everything. And now we can test the accuracy of the model. There's a question, is it the same as saying less than 0.6, greater than 0.4? No, that's not the same. When you want to split the data, you say less than 0.6, greater than 0.6. If you do less than 60 and greater than 60, points that are you know, 50 will be counted twice. So you don't want that. So we have a classified image, and now we want to check our answer against the validation one. So we can take our validation GCPs and uh, check the answer of that. Now let me print our validation GCPs. So validation GCP, because they were split from the actual GCPs, they already have the answer, right? We already know the answer that it should be one. This point has to be line for one, 
this point has to be line cover zero. What was the model's output? How do we know at this location, what did the model predict? Well, we already know the answer. This is in the classified image. We already asked the model to classify every pixel. Take our classified image, which has got the model's prediction. We have classified the image. Every pixel has been determined by the model. And we'll just say, we'll sample that from the validation GCP. And we want to just keep the land cover one. Scale 10. We need to specify the tile scale here. And you can see now each feature will have one more property from classification. So when you classify the image, this classified image has one band for classification. When you sample that, you will get a property called classification. So in this case, it says I had labeled this point with land cover zero. The model predicted the classification is zero. So this one matched. And once we have this, we can get our error matrix. The function called error matrix, where you can generate the error matrix between two properties. We can also call this confusion matrix. That's what is called in remote sensing terminology. So we'll just do this and we can print the confusion matrix. And you can see this is the confusion matrix. And I already showed you how to interpret this one. Some of you who would have done machine learning will find this a little odd. For remote sensing people, this makes complete sense. This is how remote sensing people do accuracy assessment. Because in remote sensing, what happens is you first classify the image. You already have the predicted answer at all your pixels. So we don't need to do this again. You just say, I will just check the pixel value of what was the output. And this is the way. In machine learning, what you do is you take your validation GCP and you classify your validation GCP. You sample the composite, you get the spectral signatures, and you classify that. And you only check the answer against those pixels. So again, both will result the same thing, but it's just a different workflow for remote sensing versus this. If you want to check the machine learning workflow, completed script 2B has both. I've shown you how to do this in a remote sensing way or the machine learning way. The answer will be the same but you will get this one. Also, one more note, in machine learning, the confusion matrix is inverted. The classification are the rows and the actual values are the columns. This is the confusion matrix, how remote sensing people do it. Because those two disciplines kind of evolved separately, there is a difference in terminology and difference in how uh, the conventions are. But again, the concepts are the same. Time for the exercise.